Alec Nelms, a born raconteur, has lived in Odium all his life. He recorded his reminiscences on a tiny tape recorder, which came to my notice as likely material for an audiovisual on life in Odium earlier this century. Patricia Carey and Ray Millard have patiently illustrated the scenes Alec describes. The presentation is in two parts, with a short interval halfway through. This is Odium High Street today. A little more than a generation ago, when Alec's story begins, it looked more like this. Wheatfield is in Oxfordshire, five miles from Tame and about the same distance from Watlington. It consists of a small farm of about a hundred acres, the manor house, the small church, and it hasn't changed a bit in all the 72 years I have known it. My mother was born there in 1881. She was one of a large family, seven boys and six girls. As they became old enough, they went to Lucas School, which was a four and a half mile walk in the morning and of course the same back at night. They went across the field, which was the shortest cut, but it was still a long walk for very small children. Like all the rest of children those days, she left school at 14 and went into service at Sherburn Castle, which was about five miles from Wallington and was the home of the Earl of Macclesfield. The girls in the family all went out to service and the boys stayed to work on the farm. She was very happy at the castle and years afterwards she used to tell me how very kind they were to her, the Earl of Macclesfield. There was a big staff. She went as a little maid but eventually she, ro she rose in the ranks, so to speak, and became lady's maid to the Duchess of Macclesfield which was a great thing in those days, but that took many years, of course. The photograph of the drawbridge at Sherburn Castle is perhaps of some interest. When my mother was there as a servant, somewhere about 1900, she told us, of course many years afterwards, that she remembered it being pulled up at night and lowered in the morning. She told us many years after of the great excitement and preparation made several days before the arrival of important visitors. The Prince of Wales, afterwards Edward VII, came on more than one occasion. When he came, the drawbridge was lowered, the two great lamps at the entrance were lit in readiness, and by this time the entire staff of the castle were lined up on each side of the bridge, the male staff on one side and the female on the other. And as the royal visitor and his retinue entered the castle, the men doffed their caps, and the women curtsied. It was while she was working at Sherburn Castle that she met my father. He went there as a footman. He had just returned from the South African War, where he had served with Kitchener's fighting scouts. These were a screening force which were sent out to find where the Boers war were and to inform the main body of the troops. He was in South Africa at the age of 18, although he was really only 17. He put his age on in order to join up. He was always very keen on horses. He could ride well. He came from gypsy stock. And of course entranced my mother with all the stories of what had happened in South Africa. My first recollections of him really are when he was finally demobbed in 1917. He was, in fact, invalided out. He got badly wounded. He had a bullet through his leg, through his neck and through his stomach. And this led to his premature death in 1940. He did manage to get about a bit. He was able to get a job simply because of this disability. They gave him work at the ammunition dump at Bradley. And this meant that we had to move near to where he would be because he had to get there somehow to get to work. 
So we came to Odium to live, which is where my first recollections really all lie of being here at Blake's Cottages in Odium. At this time, the family consisted of five children, and this is really the beginning of the very hard times of the dep Depression years. My father was able to ride a bicycle, but with great difficulty. He had to ride to Bramley every morning and came back at night and do his job. He was only able to do this for about two years when his leg finally collapsed altogether, and so he had to have it off. This meant that he became eligible for a pension, which was a princely sum of £10 a year, which doesn't sound very much now but in those days was looked forward to by us children with great joy because when pension day came round we all, all got a pair of boots we all had hobnail boots I think my something has, my sister has something like it but it was a great treat for us about every two years we had a wonderful trip down to the local bootmaker where we all got a pair of hobnail boots because uh, these are very welcome because up to then we had been toddling around in plinthers and the wet, so it was a great treat for us. The burden then on bringing all of us up fell on my mother. My father was really by then an invalid, so my mother with great courage shouldered the burden. In 1922 and 23 and so on, bringing up five children on nothing at all. There was a little bit of dough money too, but it was very small. So my mother kept us all going by taking in washing, which was everybody did a great deal. Lots of people took in other people's washing. It seemed to be the sole means of support for most people. Oh no, my days as a boy were spent in either fetching washing or taking washing back. We lived at Blake's Cottage, two rooms down and two up, no sanitation, no pipe water. We had certainly a gas jet one of those old-fashioned fishtailed gas jets. Most people wouldn't know what, they, what that was, but it was just a naked flame coming out of a burner. We had water from the well. My mother's job every day was to go round to the well, drop the bucket down and wind it up. And this was to keep five people going and also to do an enormous amount of washing. These were, of course, the Depression days in the 20s and the early 30s when there is no doubt that in many parts of the country and it was also quite bad in the south nobody had any work dough money was very sparse and only lasted for a few weeks and after that you didn't get any so everybody had to scrounge around to get what they could as i said my mother took in washing she seemed to be washing all day and it was dried in the bad weather round the fire so although we all knew there was a fire there we hardly ever saw it, because it was always surrounded by other people's washing being dry. Although I must say we felt very privileged, because my mother actually did the washing for Miss Ida and Miss Hilda Chamberlain, who of course were the sisters, they're both dead now, of Neville Chamberlain, uh, who was Prime Minister up to the time the war broke out. The Miss Chamberlains lived in Berry House next to the church, kept a very good household, chauffeur, a nice daimler, cook, etc., etc. And every Tuesday, my twin brother and I had a great pleasure with to carry the great basket of laundry round to the Miss Chamberlains with the laundry in, the washing as we called it. And the great thing was when we got there, we took this into the kitchen and I the cook, whom I remember with great affection, always gave us a glass of milk and an enormous piece of cake, and we were very glad to have it. When we weren't at school, whilst my mother was doing other people's washing, the rest of the family, we built a truck, and we used to go round the fields and along the hedgerows, getting wood. All the lower classes in Odin went wooding, it seemed to me, air class anyway. And this was stacked up, so we had something for the winter, because coal was simply not possible to buy. The background from which my father came ensured that he was an expert poacher, and we very often had rabbits. He was a great man with a rabbit wire. He could put a rabbit wire down in exactly the right place and then produce a rabbit in the evening. 
Occasionally we'd come back with a pheasant, uh, but we didn't have that because it was sold and we were able to buy cheap pieces of meat which went much further than the pheasant would. So they, these were sold. But we had rabbit quite a lot. Then of course we children were allowed to have the skin for which a man came round and gave, gave us a hate me eat. So that was shared out and then we would buy half penny worth of sweets, generally gobstop as I remember, because they lasted so much longer. About this time our family had increased to six children and of course my mother and father and I might just tell you how we used to arrange the sleeping uh, arrangement. Uh, my mother and father had one room and the rest of us, six children, slept in the other small room. Uh, this was a bit difficult because my sister was quite a little girl by then. So we five boys slept on one, in one bed on one side then my sister slept on the other side with a blanket in between, which was considered to be all more proper, I suppose. That went on for quite a few years. We slept like that, and we didn't seem to mind, or I don't remember that we did, except we had fleas, and this was a bit much. My mother was an expert at catching fleas. She could catch them by candlelight. We got fleas at school. Most of the children in those days had fleas. We had a bath once a week. My mother was very insistent on this. This consisted of a sink bath in front of the fire. Saucepans of water were heated up all Saturday afternoon. And we all had our bath on Saturday night. My eldest brother went in first and then, no, I think my sister was bathed first and then sent to bed. And then we boys were all bathed one at a time. And the last one was using much the same water with a little hot addition that it had been started with. But at least we were able to keep reasonably clean. And I remember looking back, this was always followed by a dose of syrup of sleep, which was considered obligatory and necessary. It wasn't the best of ideas, because the sanitary arrangements were non-existent really, but consisted of a bucket in a shed, and this was emptied once a week by a man who came from with a horse-drawn tank. He carried the bucket through the house, tipped it in, took another bucket down, and looking back, I don't think we seemed to mind very much, but really, of course, it was quite horrible. As I say, water came from, the, from a well, and about 1920, a very sad event happened, although in many ways we benefited from it. A neighbour in worse circumstances than we were finally had a mental breakdown. In fact, poor woman went quite mad and dropped her smallest grandchild down the well. She dropped the baby down the well and took a walk round the fields quite unconcerned. And when the police found her, she said, Oh well, I put him down the well. He'll be better off down there. They got the local fire brigade voluntary in those days of course and mr joe burrs the fire chief was lowered on a rope down the down the well and we were just on our way to school when we had the misfortune to see this poor little bundle brought up in the arms of mr burrows quite dead of course and the foreman that finished her life in broadmoor the benefit of it all was there was a great outcry and our landlady our landlord had to have the water laid on. He didn't, in fact, lay it into the cottages, of which there were five in those days, but he put what they call a standpipe in the yard, so at least we had a tap to which we could go. But we still had to have the buckets, I'm afraid, or rather the bucket, the dreadful bucket, right up to the time we left there. Once a year, tenders were invited by the council for the job of what was delicately termed the collection of night soil. In the 1920s, the incumbent was a well-known character who rejoiced in the name of Cronje. He had served in the South African War and had assumed the name of General Cronje, who, of course, was a well-known Boer commander. Every Monday morning, Cronje arrived at Blake's cottages to empty the buckets. His equipment consisted of a large iron tank on two wheels drawn by a sad and aged grey horse. In between calls, 
Kron, he sat on the chair smoking a clay pipe. He invariably arrived at our cottage at breakfast time and insisted on carrying the bucket through the cottage, quite often stopping to inquire after our health, which after all he wasn't doing very much to improve. On one hot morning he took off his jacket and laid it on top of the tank. Unfortunately, he had forgotten to close the trap door through which he emptied the bucket, and into the tank his jacket disappeared. Charles Stonehouse came along, and to his surprise found Cronje fishing about in the dreadful interior with a stick. So the following conversation ensued. Good God, Cronje, said Charlie, whatever be you at? Well, said Cronje, my old jacket's fell in here, I'm going to get him out again. Ah, well, said Charlie, if that were my jacket, I'd let him bide there. Oh, no, said Cronje, I can't do that. I got a bit of bread and cheese in the pocket of him. Our landlord uh, was a local gentleman, and he was very much a pillar of the Baptist chapel, which of course still exists, but is not now used. And we children, because of this, and because we were frequently in arrears, in arrears with the rent, with the rent, uh, which was only about a shilling a week anyway, but couldn't always be paid. So in order, as my father said, to keep on the right side of him, we all decided we would in fact join the Baptist chapel, and this became for us a very much a full-time occupation. In those days, we had to go to the morning service on Sunday as children, then we went to the evening service, and then of course we had to go to Sunday school in the afternoon, and then on Mondays there was what is known as Christian Endeavour, Tuesday night, I remember, was the young men's Bible class. Thursday was the Band of Hope. So we became very religious indeed. At least we went a lot. But the idea was to make sure that we would keep him with our landlord. Uh, and I must say that to use an army expression, it rather put me off organized religion for quite a long time. Anyway, it kept a roof over our heads uh, because I think our landlord tended to look a bit more kindly on us because we were such diligent churchgoers. We, we made sure we sat in the front where he could see us. I remember the name of the pastor at that time. It was Pastor Brooks. He used to preach the real old-fashioned fire and brimstone services. And the hymns were particularly horrific, I think, looking back. I remember one of the hymns we sang at Sunday school. The words made my hair stand on end. After all, I was only eight. The words went rather like this, and this was the chorus. I love thee in life, I love thee in death, I love thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and I'll say when the death dew lies cold on my brow, if ever I love you, dear Jesus, tis now. I was rather <coughs> an imaginative little boy, and it used to frighten me rather to think of the death due. In fact, it really was quite unsuitable for little boys of eight to think such dreadful words. I wonder how many people will remember, or, or they may wonder indeed, what the Band of Hope was. This was a very strong organisation in the 20s, which of course had existed for many years, and was formed to combat the demon drink, as it was called. Well, of course, drunkenness. I didn't do much drinking, of course, at that tender age, but we joined this for the reasons I've already explained. In fact, having belonged to it for quite a few months with my brothers, we were finally granted a certificate in which we solemnly stated and signed that we would no longer partake of strong drink, we would stop beating our wives and generally misbehaving, which was a bit odd, really, 10 or 11 years of age. But we signed it. As a matter of fact, I, I've still got my no, but I'm not quite sure whether the Band of Hope even exists today. It was certainly a time of great harshness for some people, the 20s. And I do remember quite vividly, vividly that the whole thing consisted of two classes, the haves and the have-nots and the haves were particularly anxious to ensure in no way 
that they gave up any of their privileges to those who had not. But I must hasten to say that in between one met great kindness. In particular, the two doctors we had here in those days, we had Dr. Mac McIntosh, a Scot of course, dour but very kind, and then we had Dr. Woodison. He had served during the first war with the New Zealand forces in France. When the war was over, he came to Odium, married a local lady, and then settled down and became a GP. In those days, one never sent for the doctor, unless it was so serious and so horrifying that one had no choice. Because to get the doctor meant you pay three shillings and sixpence, which was completely out of the reach of most people. At this time, my mother got very worried about me. I was the weakling of the family. I had consumption, and on one particular occasion she was so frightened and worried about my condition that she put her coat on and went down to the doctor, Dr. Woodison, who promptly came up and did all he could for me. In those days, this consisted of hot lint placed on the ch chest, cod liver oil and malt, which he went and bought himself, as I remember. We couldn't afford it. He then arranged for his wife to bring up hot soup and finally got my on, me on my feet, uh, which had much worried my brother because she didn't know how the hell she was going to pay the doctor's bills. They finally came in. I think there were four of them at three and six months of visit. So she worked a little harder at the washing and paid off sixpence a week. Then one day she met Dr. Woodard in the street. He was the most kind of man, men. And she said, well, doctor, I'm trying very hard to get your bill paid off. And he said, well, how much do you owe me now? And she said, I think it's ten shillings. He said, you still got the account I sent to you? She said, oh, yes, I have. Well, he said, have you got a fire in the house? And she said, yes, we've got a fire. He said, well, I'll tell you what you do. Pick up that bill and drop it out in the fire and forget all about it. Uh, this was a sort of kindness that one did meet against the harshness which predominated. The great event of the year which we all looked forward to was hop picking time. In those days, from Odeon to Long Sutton, almost the whole area on both the left and the right of the road were given over to the growing of hops. In those days, there was no, thing, no such thing as mechanical hop picking. It was all done by hand, and much looked forward to by all those who went. We all went as a family, I remember. It began about the middle of September, and we used to get up at five in the morning, walk nearly to Long Sutton. My smallest brother was pushing a little push there. The rest of us walked, and as soon as the dew was off the hops, then the picking started. At the end of the week, we would get our money and sometimes we'd earn as much as two pounds. That would be for the whole family, of course, but it was a very great help. And I remember so well the smell of the hops when they were being picked in dawn. It was as much a holiday for us children as it was work, although, of course, we were all expected to stand round a great big bin, as they called it. This was an enormous wickerwork basket into which the hops were picked, picked and when we had it, finally got it full, the checker came round, made sure it was full and made a note, and then we filled the next one, and this went on for about three weeks. Then, of course, they were brought down here to Odium and dried in the kiln in King Street, and then made into beer at Alton. And believe me, the smell of the hops in the evening as it was getting dusk and as they were being roasted was really quite marvellous. It may seem strange looking back, but the social structure in Odium seemed to be made up of three quite definable layers. There was the working class, the poor as they were always called, the middle class, and then the upper class. And then there was yet another class of which we saw very little. They seemed to live on Mount Olympus. This was the Peters, the Mild Major, Dogmasfield, and people of that sort. They only descended from the mountain on court days, which was once a fortnight, when they came to dispense justice, dispense with justice, some people used to say, but perhaps I will talk about the court a little later on. A great standby in those days for the poor was Sheep's Head. 
You could buy a sheep's head for about supper, and when it was boiled and the meat taken off, it produced some excellent soup to last three or four days. There was an old story of the woman much told in those days who says to the butcher, let me have a sheep's head, butcher, leave the eyes in, because you've got to see us all through next week. And there was a great deal of truth in this, really. I will return to the courthouse for a second. In the 20s, we had a courthouse here, a police station, and even three cells. This was all combined in the building, which is now the library, and the dentist, and Andrew Baird. The magistrate court sat one fortnight. They used to deal with cases of petty larceny, failure to have a dog license, paternity cases, and one of the most serious things, much frowned on, was poaching. The magistrates were all landlords themselves and were anxious to preserve their game, naturally. So everyone found taking a, a pheasant was very severely dealt with. I remember on one occasion that a woman and her son were caught taking a pheasant and they got a month's hard labour in Winchester Prison. I know that the London papers were rather shocked and took it up, but it was soon forgotten, and they both came home, and that was the end of it. There was a character who lived in the Berry, almost opposite where I now live. He was the son of Ebenezer Stonehouse, by the name of Charles Stonehouse. All was at war with Sergeant Waters who was always trying to get him from poaching, but could never do it. Everyone liked old Charlie, and we all followed with great interest his war with Sergeant Waters. One day he heard that old Charles had a dog. He knew he wouldn't have a license, so he called at the house and said, Come on, Charlie, where's your dog license? Charlie said in his broad Hampshire accent, Well, I ain't got a dog. Oh, said Sergeant Waters, I thought you had. No, said Charlie, I ain't got a dog. So away went Sergeant Waters. He called several times, hoping to catch Charlie without a license. Until one day he knocked at the door and the dog came out. And Sergeant Waters said, oh, he said, you have got a dog then? No, Charlie says, I tell you, I ain't got a dog. Well, he said, what the hell is that then? Well, he said, that's a bitch. Fine two and sixpence at the court and one shilling for wasting the time of the police. Deaths, funerals and wakes were made much more of in those days. How very well Alec describes all this. When there was a death in those days in the village, the knell and the parish church tower was always sounded to let people know that someone had died. Of course, this custom has gone out now, but for years it was kept up. Mr. Alf Taplin, he was a full-time verger in those days. When someone died, he would hurry up to the church, and after a time you'd hear the knell sounding. And you'd know whether it was a man, woman, or child, because for a man, the knell would be told for so many minutes. For a woman, a little bit less and for a child less than that. So people would listen and say, oh dear, such and such a child is dead, or that must be poor old Mrs. So-and-so gone then. All the working class had a great dread of being buried in those days in what was known as on the parish. That is to say, if you had no money, they provided what was known as a pauper's funeral, where the parish provided a cheap coffin, and that was about all. So people in those days would save up carefully for years to get enough money to get them together to make sure they had what they would call a respectable funeral. They would even go without things to make sure they had the money when they died. That when they died, so they would have a nice funeral. They would say, I want a nice piece of elm. Or if they had saved enough money, I'm going to have a nice oak polished coffin. It was very important to them. In those days, we had no chapel of rest, at least not for the lower classes. When someone died, the body was kept in the cottage. It was always moved into what was known as the front room. After a day or two, Charlie Smith, the undertaker, would come up with his measuring tape, trying not to look too pleased 
about it all. He'd do a bit of measuring, and a couple of days later he would have a coffin ready, if he had the right size. He would bring it up on his handcart, take it in, the body was put in the coffin, and there it remained in the front room with the lid off. An old friend of my father died in Sheep's Head Square. My father heard about this, and it was the custom to go down and see the body, commiserate with the widow, have a look at the late departed and say goodbye. This was quite regularly done. My father went down and saw his old friend and said to the widow, well, I must say, he looks quite happy. The dear old lady said, well, of course he would look like that, wouldn't he? Because he died in his sleep and he don't even know he's dead yet. I mentioned the undertakers particularly. I remember the one I knew best. He had his workshop in the Farnham Road, Charles Smith. Always wore a white apron and a bowler hat. He used to make the coffins and do everything on his own. As a matter of fact, he arranged my father's funeral. This cost £20. He was always busy, particularly in the winter. In those pe days, people died of things they would never die of today. Pneumonia was nearly always a killer. Meningitis, several people died of lockjaw. Tuberculosis, or consumption as we called it, was a great killer. They didn't know what to do about it. Nowadays we all are much better fed and looked after, and it, it has been beaten. In those days there were two forms of consumption. People would speak in a hushed whisper, poor so-and-so had consumption, and his dreadful fellow traveller, a much qu quicker killer, galloping consumption. Anyway, on the day of the funeral, Charlie Smith would come up with his screwdriver, and as he called it, screw him down. In other words, he would put the lid on the coffin, and later on he would come with a little hand hearse and put the coffin on, put a strap over it, and pull it up to the cemetery, and the relations would walk behind. In fact, we know that this beer is still in existence, and now in the church it sells warmer, but I have seen it used many times. I always remember it, it needed oiling very badly. It used to make a squeaking noise all the way up the street. Charlie Smith had a rather macabre sense of humour, and the story is told that after a funeral one day when he buried a very old man who lived here and his brother came up from somewhere near Portsmouth to the funeral. Charlie remembered and knew him and as he walked out of the cemetery, Charlie said to him, How old are you now then, Albert? And Albert said, Well, I should soon be 94. And Charlie looked at him and said, Oh, dear me, he said, It's hardly worth you going home, is it? The poverty I remember as a child, I'm afraid that memory lives with me right up to now, although I'm over 74. I remember one instance, William Hook living within a few do doors of us. He had three children. One of the little girls was about two, and the pet cat scratched her on the lip, and within a week she was dead of blood poisoning. There was no penicillin or anti antibiotics in those days. It was very sad. He couldn't afford to pay Charlie Smith for the funeral, which would have been 20 pounds. So he made a coffin himself, painted it white, put the child in it, and carried the little coffin up to the cemetery, dug the grave, and buried the child. Later on, we other children got wildflowers and put them on the grave. I went to London Rose School, but my school days I don't look back on them with any great pleasure. The cane was much in evidence and much used. I left school when I was 13 and a half. In those days you could, provided you had a job to go to. I learned up to my 12 times table, a little bit of math, and once a year on Empire Day, you went out into the playground and were shown a map which showed great red areas which we were told belonged to us. But frankly, I didn't see any benefit from it. <laughs> as soon as I left school, I got a job as errand boy at G.H. Terry and Sons, general purveyors, families waited on daily. I used to ride the trade, trade bike all over the place with them. I got four shillings a week. 
Of course, everyone in Odium did their shopping here. There were no cars, plenty of horses. In fact, to see a car in Odium was quite a rarity. I can remember the people who had them all these years ago. The doctor, of course, had one. I think old Mr. Dicker had one, and old Bullnose Morris. Mr. James Brooks, the solicitor, had one, but that was about all there was. And to see a car come through steaming away, as they often did, used to excite us, and we boys used to run to see them. Most people had horses and carriages. Lady Peter lived at Hatwood. She was driven down by a coachman and a brougham, and she used to pull up old Terry's shop, which was the biggest grocery in those days. Old Mr. Terry used to come out with a white apron and a straw hat. Dead for years, of course. He used to come out with a great deal of bowing and scraping, take Lady Peter's order. And, of course, that had to be up at the house about 12 o'clock. Uh, he would deliver about 10. But there was a great competition for that sort of trade. Even when I was a boy, it was known as the carriage trade. Of course, as I was Aaron boy, it was my job to take Lady Peter's order up with great instructions from Mr. Terry to be sure to go to the back door, take your hand off when you get there. I used to like going there because there was an awfully nice cook. She used to take me into the kitchen and give me a nice piece of cake and a glass of milk. So going to Lady Peter's was a great treat. In those days, things in draper's shops were always priced at two shillings and eleven pence three farthings. Two and eleven three, they used to call it. Or five and eleven three, or one and eleven three. But you didn't get a farthing change, you were given a packet of pins. This was a very fascinating paper, which had pins all the way through it, and people quite happily accepted this instead of a farthing. Of course, there were other shops. In the berry, there was the baker's old Mrs. Hall. She used to sell the be most beautiful cottage loaves and wrap them in newspaper and then they went round the town. I believe they were tuppence. Old Mr. Bill Bento Bentoed, he used to bake in the berry as well, he used to push the bread and the most beautiful cakes and donuts all over the place. Lardy cakes was a great treat in those days. He used to push it around in a little truck Fishy Hill came round with his fish. Even the muffin man came up the street with a bell and a great tray of muffins perched on his head. The big event of the year was, of course, the Lent Fair, which was always held in the Berry. This lasted nearly a week. It was a very big show indeed. In fact, it spread down the Berry and we had stalls all the way down the high street. There was all sorts of side shows fat ladies, etc., freaks. Toffee was made and sold, cut up with scissors, scissors. nap for flares, that's all the light they had. Great power of his things blazing away. We had Stokes's roundabout. They were the great fair people in those days. Galloping horses with the organ bashing away, chair of planes, swings, all sorts of side shows. I remember one chap had a small shot side show there and he had a sign out said, outside which said he was exhibiting the gen genuine skull of Oliver Cromwell and he did indeed have a human skull on the table and we paid a penny to look at this and he said there you are this is the skull of Oliver Cromwell anyway the story went round that one of the this story went around, and one of the history masters at Lord Bonsworth College heard about this skull and thought he would come and see it. And of course, when he looked at it, he said to this fairground chap, Look, that can't be the skull of Oliver Cromwell. That's a very small skull. And Oliver Cromwell was a very big man. And without turning a hair, the man said, Ah, well, you see, sir, he said, that was his skull when he was a small boy.
Many Odium residents will complain we have omitted this and that. Too true. Moreover, a lot of Alex material perforce ended up on the cutting room floor in order to maintain a manageable length. However, the now derelict assembly rooms must be given pride of place for having played such an important part in the social life of Odium. You would hardly think it possible to look at that building today. In the late 20s and the early 30s, at the very centre of all the social events which took place in Odium was, of course, the assembly room, now unfortunately derelict. It looks pretty grim now, but in those days, it was the very centre of everything that happened in Odium. There was always some event going on there. There would be the farmer's ball, the conservative ball, the hunt ball, and the farmer's ball. British League and supper and dance always took place there. Every week there was some event on, many, many dances and balls. People in those days went properly dressed the men in dinner jackets, dancing pumps were always carried and changed into when you got to the assembly room. Boots were always left outside. Many people won't be aware, but we had a marvellous touring theatrical company which used to come quite often, Henry Beckett and Company. I suppose really we would call them now barnstormers. They used to put on a dramatic play every night of the week and it was quite marvellous because the front seats were open and then we boys, if we could manage to get threepence, we sat in the gallery. I can remember well the plays they used to put on. Every night something different. I remember they did Mariah Martin or The Murderer in the Red Barn. Another one was Caught by Wireless, that was of course Dr. Crippen. They did She Stoops to Conquer, East Lynn, and one I remember very well and was very impressed by was one called The Fighting Parson. It was pure melodrama, of course, but we thought it was quite marvellous. And it was really the old story of the wicked squire and the innocent village girl. And of course, The Fighting Parson, a very nice chap with his dog collar, he was very busy defending her honour against the walls of the wicked squire. I remember the words in the assembly rooms now as the fighting parson confronts the wicked squire. The wicked squire, big black moustache, everything that went with it, and I can hear the words ringing out now when the fighting parson says to the squire, have a care, sir. Don't raise the bad blood in my veins, for I can hit and hit hard. These words were, of course, loudly cheered by everyone. And I remember in the silence afterwards, someone shaking from the gallery to the squire, let that gal alone, you wicked old sod. <laughs> and then, opposite the assembly rooms, we had a roller skating rink. This is where Longley's the builders are now. There was a concrete floor there, and Mr. Baker, he of the garage, decided to branch out and open a roller skating rink. So he bought some roller skates, and we went in there. I think we paid tuppence, and you could hire a pair of roller skates and skate up and down on the concrete, which was considered very modern and great fun. And that place lasted for quite a few years. Of course, in those days, there was no wireless, as we used to call it. One or two homemade crystal sets were just creeping in, but very few people had them. So, of course, we looked forward to Henry Beckett, and company, and the fair. And then, of course, the great event of the year, the Old Fellows' Fate, was always on August Bank Holiday. That was quite a big show in those days. We were all in the Old Fellows, all as children, and we had a little sash put round us. And when the great day came, we were all formed up in the berry to march what was the Club Meadow, which is now where the buildings in Archery Field stands all disappeared now. We marched behind a great banner carried by four of the biggest chaps in the Odd Fellows. It must have been 30 feet high, very Victorian. It had a great illustration of a poor man looking in rather a bad state, lying in bed, obviously at death's door. 
leaning over him were two gentlemen with big black beards, and underneath was the legend, I was sick and you visited me, I was homeless and you took me in. I think it still exists, but it must be quite a collector's item, I'm sure. Another feature of those days was the great number of tramps one saw on the roads. All the time through the day you could see tramps, perhaps one, or sometimes in twos. There never seemed to be more than two at a time. They used to pass through the village towards the later afternoon on their way to Winchfield Workhouse. There was a workhouse at Whitchurch too. There was one at Andover, a big one in Basingstoke, that's now gone, and the one at Winchfield. And of course the secret was, you could get a night's lodging, but you were only allowed to stay one night. Then you were turned out in the morning. And it was obligatory those days to do so much work which paid for your keep for the night. When you were turned out in the morning, your great objective was to beg your way to the next workhouse. workhouse. So when they were turned out to say Witchers, they would make for perhaps Winchfield, which would be a good day's walk. On the way they would beg, collect dog ends was another thing they used to do. It was rather a sad sight looking back. They carried their bags and sacks on their backs, feet tied with rags to keep them warm. Then they would get as far as Winchfield and stay the night there. They had to get to the workhouse by sundown because at sundown the gates were locked and you couldn't get in after that. Any money they had in their possession was taken off then to pay for their night's keep. So they had a habit then of when they got near the workhouse they'd find a place in the bank on the side of the road, mark it carefully, and put their few coppers in there. And in the morning, when they came out, they'd pick them up and move on to the next workhouse, which I think was at Farnham in those days. I knew Basingstoke workhouse very well, better even than Winchfield. I expect most people know it consisted of two sections, the infirmary, this was the part where old people went when they got very old and feeble and they were never known to come out of there. The other, and then the other part, of course, was known as the casual wards where these chaps off the road came so they could get a nice lodging. I remember the casual ward at Basingstoke very well. It was very grim indeed. They had these enormous wards, one or two iron beds, and when they had a sudden influx of people, they just gave them a big sack. They'd go and fill it with straw and a blanket, and they'd sleep there for the night. I remember well how it smelled. It smelled of carbolic and stale urine. They had a simple breakfast before they left in the morning. They had to tidy their bed up, do an hour's work in the garden, chop wood or anything else, and then, of course, they would go on and move on to the next workhouse. In about 1923, or perhaps 24, was the year when the Nancy Bus Company was formed in Odium. This consisted of Mr. Fred Munger, his wife, one driver, and two rather aged buses. The first bus to leave in the morning left Odium at a quarter past seven. This was a workman's bus, and most of the chaps who didn't work on the farms found work at Thornycross because in those days, Thorny Cross and Basingstoke were the biggest employers. The fare for what they called a workman's ticket was three shillings and sixpence a week. You went off in the morning and back at night, six days a week for three and sixpence. And there was one slight drawback, perhaps. The buses were rather aged, and sometimes when they got to the bottom of Greywell Hill, which of course was pretty steep, and if they had stopped in Greywood to pick someone up, they probably couldn't get enough, enough speed to get over the hill. So when they got to the bottom of the hill, the bus would go no further, so Mr. Munger used to say, Come on, gentlemen, please, all the gentlemen outside to push. Of course, the ladies can stay where they are. So all we chaps got out behind to push the bus up the hill, the engine running to help. And when we got to the top of the hill, it was pretty well all clear for Bajan, so as long as, of course, they didn't stop too often. I remember so well 
the fire brigade. The fire engine was situated where the parish room is now. The fire station was there. Now it is pulled down, of course. There was a tower in which they, when they came back from the fire, they could hang the hose to, hoses to drain and dry out. Of course, the engine was horse-drawn. When there was a fire, the brigade turned out. And I remember so well all the people who lived near the fire station were, on, were in the fire brigade. There was Mr. Ezra Burroughs, local blacksmith, his brother Joseph, Charles Wendy, Hector Hand. Charlie Wendy kept the greengrocery in the high street in those days. And when the fire broke out, old Mr. Bain, who was the cobbler in King Street next to the Baptist Chapel, used to get on his bicycle and go round to all the people he knew were in the fire brigade and ring a bell. And they used to dash up to the fire station, pull out the fire engine. Then somebody rushed up to terrace the grocers, got two horses, brought them down, harnessed them up, and the way they used to go. The prosperity of Odium in those days depended almost entirely on the success of the farms, which of course in their turn depended entirely on good weather. Not as today, where you never lose a harvest, if you've got combined harvesters, dry and plant, etc. Everything in those days depended on the weather. And of course, if haymaking was bad, it was quite a disaster. But if the harvest failed, it was even worse. So many people worked on the farms that they needed to have good weather to keep going. I know that at Palace Gate Farm on a Friday night when the men got paid, it was nothing to see 25 men come out, carters, ploughmen, milkmen, etc., etc. A farm labourer's wage in those days, that is an ordinary labourer, was 12 shillings and sixpence a week. The head carter got about 15 shillings, the cowman a pound and free milk. Of course, they did have their cottages free. The cycle of farming was the same every, every year. There would be dung carting all through the winter. Then came ploughing, sowing the seed, and after that came haymaking. Then there would be a short pause, and then, of course, along came harvest. This was tremendous yard work. It was quite usual at harvest time for farm labour to carry two and a half underweights of corn on his back when it was being thrashed, and he would probably have to grub a long, steep ladder with it on his back, helped by a rope, and stack it up. And, of course, as a consequence, most of them were old before their time, there's no doubt of that. Most of them were ruptured, and they'd buy a truss, put that on, put a strong belt around their stomachs to hold themselves in, and carry on working. Another feature I remember so well as a boy was the number of village idiots. We had several in Odium. There was two or three at Gravel, quite harmless. Generally big fat boys dribbling a little, always anxious to please, always glad to get in with a little group. Sometimes they were the butt of unkind jokes, but generally I think they were treated quite kindly. They used to grin and smile and laugh a lot. And of course they were really the result of too close liaison between families, I'm afraid. But that has all disappeared now. One of them I remember well, he used to pump the organ at the parish church. He loved that job because it gave him a feeling of great importance and belonging and doing a useful job but that was really about the limit of his capabilities. Most of the cottages in those days had fair-sized gardens, so besides growing vegetables, they would keep a pig. They would put up a homemade sty, buy a little piglet in the spring, fatten it all through the summer, and then it would be killed in the late autumn, as there would be no flies then, cured, hung up, and that would keep a family right through the winter. Mr. Frank Monk had a small holding at the bottom of the town, once again where archery fields is now, and he kept pigs, of course, chicken, geese, etc. He also had a prize boar. I remember well, his name was Jimmy, very much prized by those who had sows, because he was extremely amorous. 
he provided all the baby pigs around this area for a very long time. It was quite common to see a sow being brought down the high street to meet Jimmy. They'd always put a rope on the sow's leg so she wouldn't run away. And she was slowly taken down and met Jimmy. And later on, of course, there would be baby pigs. The farm workers had a language which seemed to be all their own. Perhaps a new man would come to a farm and not like it. Someone would say to him in, in their Hampshire accent, Who be getting on up there then? The reply might be, Oh, he can't make nothing on him. This was, of course, a reference to his new master. I say he poke up with him much longer. I'm afraid I'll have to appear to him. Anyway, I shall pack it up, come back on us. I suppose a free in interpretation would be something like, how are you getting on at your new job? Oh, I can't understand my new boss. As a matter of fact, I can't put up with the man, and I'm going to tell him straight. I shall leave when Michaelmas comes. Michaelmas, of course, the time when, when nearly all the farm workers change their jobs. Another feature of village life in those days was the slate and thrift clubs. These were always run by the pubs, and as soon as Christmas, Christmas was over, People started to pay so much a week into their local club, and the landlord then invested this money. Slate clubs were what the name suggests they are. It was really put onto a slate, though of course later on they kept proper books, and a man would pay threepence a week, or even sixpence a week, if he could afford it, all through the year, and at Christmas time he would draw it out for all the extra expenses of Christmas. The thrift clubs were very similar and they were also paid into pubs. In the event of, Ill of illness, a man could go to his thrift club, state his case, and provided he could prove he needed some money, they would give him a little money to help him through illness or something of that sort. In fact, there's a rather sad story of the landlord of the Tuns, now long disappeared, which was in the high street. When Christmas got near, all his customers who had paid into his club we're looking forward to getting the money out. Unfortunately, he has spent it, so there was no money. As the days grew near to pay out, his customers were there and said, when are you going to start to pay out? And he put them off with various, various excuses. And when the day came which he promised to pay out, he was unable to do so. So he went down to the garden very early in the morning, threw a rope over a tree and hanged himself. Another strange feature of those days I remember so well was the number of deformed people there were about. Lots of young people had bow legs, knock knees, hump backs, people with club foot, all the manifestations of malnutrition in their formative years. Of course, most of them, like myself, had been brought up in the early days of the First War, when food was certainly very short. I suppose some people could get it but otherwise rationing was very severe indeed. And at the very time when you needed good food, you weren't getting it. 1924, I think, was a year quite disastrous when the entire harvest failed in this area. There was torrential rain all through August, September and October, almost to Christmas. And I can remember seeing the corn still stacked up in stooks all the way from here to Long Sutton, black and ruined. A lot of farmers did go bankrupt. The smaller ones had their farms under mortgage, and the mortgages were called in, so they had no homes either. In fact, there was one sad case of a farmer at Reedon. His harvest failed. He was relying on it to pay debts. The harvest failed, and in desperation, he got up one morning, walked to Hook Station, walked up the line a little way and threw himself under a train. In fact, I pass his grave quite often, near the vestry door of the church today. This was a time when farm labourers could be evicted from their cottages if they displeased the farmer. It was very easy to do. If a chap wasn't working hard enough or did something wrong, of course, they were all tied cottages in those days but the law very much came down on the side of the farmer. 
I am old enough to remember seeing quite clearly a family being evicted at Hillside, at the farm there. The chap I knew didn't work hard enough, or he did something wrong, and a court order was made to turn him out, as the farmer wanted the cottage for the new man. And one morning the baby was rolled up, took all his furniture out, everything out of the house was put onto the side of the road, keys were taken away, and there he was, left with his children, family, furniture, and that was it. And of course, the next stage in those days was the workhouse, and this is where they went. Of course, it wasn't all gloom and sadness, I mustn't pretend that, and we had some quite wonderful characters here. I rem remember down at Poland Lane, we had Simon de Montfort, who said he was the 16th Earl of Leicester, and indeed spent most of his life trying to prove that he was. Over his cottage door, he had the legend written, This is the home of Simon de Montfort, 16th Earl of Leicester. We had many tragic cases of the men coming back from the 1418 war, some with a leg missing, arm missing, and looking back, I think the very saddest of all were those who were suffering from shell shock. Of course, they've all been forgotten now and they're all dead. But I remember several cases, one man in particular from North Warmbra, who walked up and down the street all day with his arms over his ears, shutting out the thunder of the guns which he had suffered on the Western Front. And there were several cases like that. And then we had those who came in from Aldershot or somewhere like that. They were coming a little band, shuffling along in the gutter, playing or singing for money, still proudly wearing their campaign medals. On Saturday nights, the farm chaps came down to the various pubs, of which there were at least a dozen in and around Odium. Of course, beer could be bought for threepence a pint, but it was fourpence. This was their one night out in the week, when they would come down and meet chaps from the other farms and compare notes. They talked in a broad Hampshire accent, which one doesn't hear much now. One would say, where be at it now then, Bert? Oh, still up yonder. What's it like? Not so bad. What's he like up there? Not so bad. What's the A like? Not so bad. Another thing I remember so well in early in the mid springtime was the arrival of great numbers of gypsies in their caravans, always with a lurcher dog running underneath hordes of children, and they would come to do what they called the pea hacking. That, of course, was gathering the pea crop. They were cut with rip hooks, and they would also do all the hoeing. They would take on a contract piece, and would do it for so much an acre. In those days, there was no mechanical means of hoeing between the rows of Swedes and turnips, so a whole family of gypsies would, gypsies would take it on, and they'd be out in the field with their hoes. Sometimes they were a bit of a nuisance. They used to get so drunk in the pubs. I remember one enormous chap, a gypsy called Cockado. He challenged all the local chaps to a fight for 10 shillings, which was quite a lot of peak money. Several people had to go and got beaten up. Until over at Mill Lane near Crondall, where the plough inn was, but is no longer, a chap came home from the Navy, fellow named Gregory very big man. He had been a stoker on the coal ships and he was really very strong indeed. Anyway, he heard about Cocker Doe's challenge, took it up, and of course we children heard of this and away we went to see the wonderful fight. They fought outside the pub. It went on for, I should say, about half an hour and in the end, Bonzo Gregory, the ex-sailor, reduced the gypsy to a, just a massive pulp. He really hammered and hammered him, broke his jaw, his nose was bashed in, quite a dreadful sight. And when it was all over, the other gypsies carried him away, and Mr. Gregory went, went back triumphant to the bar, 
with his ten shillings, and we all had a drink. It was about 1924 that the RAF first came to Odium. It was only a summer camp in those days. I think they came about April time and stayed until September. They flew the aircraft up from Andover. They had putties and peak caps and looked very smart. Made a great sensation in the village when they first arrived. They had bell tents, tin huts, and I think the first aircraft that came up here was the Audax. I remember it very well. In fact, if you could run fast when they came, came into land, you could run across the field from here to the aerodrome and get there when they landed. You could run underneath them. There was a pilot, an observer, sitting at the back. They would wave to us children as we ran underneath. In fact, we were lucky one day, we saw one land on top of the cookhouse, which was quite a treat. Anyway, no one was hurt. I think the influx of a lot of new young men in the village was viewed with some apprehension by the village matrons. You keep away from them there flying fellas, Emma, say, they would say. We don't want you getting into trouble. Later on, of course, the permanent aerodrome was built, built by MacAlpine. It was a big undertaking for those days. An enormous amount of Irish labour appeared here. But in 1924, there was no runway at the landing field. They just landed on the grass. The early planes had just one engine started by hand. Someone would swing the propeller. They would sometimes land where they were meant, not meant to, such as in a field of corn. Of course, they were all under training. In fact, all that time, I only remember one casualty. I think it was the second year they were here. Several of these young Air Force boys came down to the village one night and had a drink. And on the way back, they saw an apple tree overhanging the chalk pit. And they thought they'd have an apple or two. And one of them overreached himself too much, fell to the bottom and was killed. The commanding officer at that time at the camp had the bright idea of using the dog queue for bombing practice. In those days on the early aircraft, they were actually army reconnaissance planes. The bombs were fixed on the underside of the wings. So the dog queue was formed up in column fours in the berry. Of course, nearly all these men had marched in France and knew all about that. Even my father limped along with them on one stick. They marched round by Long Sutton and out to South Warmbur. And as they marched, the airplanes took off from the camp loaded with flower bags of all things, and then drop these bags on the marching column unemployed. I know my father got a direct hit because he came back covered in flour, but they were quite pleased about it. They got two and six from marching around all morning and were very pleased to have it. And so in 1929, we finally left Blake's cottages and came into the high street. We left with no regrets. It had been a harsh time, especially for my mother, who had exchanged the dignity and comfort of a lady's maid at Sherburne Castle for the drudgery of doing other people's washing. My childhood, really, had been a time of flies, fleas, smells, packed clothes, candles to go to bed, other people's cast-offs, boiled sheep's heads, endless rabbit to eat, and as a special treat on Sunday tea, bread and margarine with a thin film of black treacle, and always the knowledge that my mother had frequently, frequently gone without herself, as there was insufficient for the rest of us. Yet I never remember her complaining. But before I leave Blake's cottages for good, it might be of some interest to recall, at that time, there were 60 children and adults living in the five cottages there. In fact, her next-door neighbour had three adults and ten children in two rooms up and two down. The small shop my mother rented, which is now the Chesser restaurant, was luxurious in comparison with Blake's cottages. It had four bedrooms. So to my sister's great delight, for the first time in her life, she had her own bedroom. There was no bathroom. 
I suppose by present standards it would be considered primitive. There was no main drainage. Water was obtained from a pump in the yard. No electricity. The premises had been unoccupied for several years, so that the first week was spent in clearing away a great deal of rubbish, cobwebs, etc., and the debris of years of neglect. My mother was ever a supreme optimist, and she had no doubts in her own mind if, as she said, we all pulled together, we'd be all right. The years eventually proved her right. I think it was about 1932 that the main drainage was brought to Odium. Water was laid on in the high street, the well was filled in, and Cronje and his dreadful cart departed into history. About 1934, the worst of the depression seemed to be over, and the little shop my mother had started with exactly five shillings capital, 25 pence, began to prosper. By then my brothers and I were at work, as indeed was my sister, so we were able to contribute a little and were no longer such a burden to her. In 1935 I completed my apprenticeship to hairdressing and decided to be my own master. The corn chandler's premises where I had worked as a 13-year-old became vacant. This is now known as Fountain's Arcade. It was just a large barn really. Inside there was just one floor. There were no other floors in it. My mother could see the possibilities of opening a cafe in the same premises. I shall never know how she persuaded Lloyd Banks to advance her the money without any security, but she did. And with, within six months, a first floor was put in, the Cherry Cafe was established, and above the cafe, a ladies' and gentlemen's hairdressing saloon. It was instantly successful. She retained the tenancy of the original shop across the road, in case, as she said, Things went wrong, and it was still opened early in the morning, not later than 7 a.m., and was the last shop to close at night. In those days, the lamplighter did his round of the village at dusk, lighting the gas lamps, and at 10.30 p.m. he went on his rounds again and put them out. This was a signal for the lights to go out in the little shop, and Odin went to sleep. The hairdressing side of the business, business was equally as successful as the cafe restaurant. By 1937, we had in the gentleman's department four hairdressers, called barbers in those days, of course, and we had four girls in the ladies' side. My father died in 1940. It was quite sudden. His estate was divided between his children, and as the total sum amounted to £2.50, plus his South African and First War, First War medals, it was decided not to employ a solicitor to wind up the estate. Charlie Smith, the undertaker, arranged the funeral. My mother wept a little, and then reopened both the shops as soon as we returned from the churchyard. She had been devoted to him with all his faults, but could see no reason now to lose money now that he was dead. By this time, we were hearing much talk of war with Germany. Crystal sets had been su supplanted by more powerful valve radios, and we were able to hear clearly the hysterical rantings of Adolf Hitler. Later on, of course, we also frequently picked up the sinister voice of William Joyce, Lord Haw Haw, Germany calling, Germany calling. After the war, of course, he was shot as a traitor. Charlie Stonehouse, now an old man, heard the news of Joyce's execution with great satisfaction and remarked, Ah, that'll learn the old bugger. The war was drawing nearer now, and Odium was never to be the same again. We had a cinema, now the Regal, with, if you please, a commissionaire resplendent in uniform. We had a fish and chip shop. Thornycroft Engineering Works at Basingstoke worked round the clock making trucks for the army and any remaining unemployed got jobs there. The dole queues melted away and the unemployment exchange finally closed. 
My brother and I were demobbed from the army in 1945. In their absence, the rest camp and the hairdressers under my mother had progressed exceedingly. In 1954, she sold the restaurant and went back to the original small shop. And here, with unflagging enthusiasm, applied herself to making it once again a thriving concern. In 1960, she purchased the freehold of both the shops. In 1963, she decided to retire, sold both the premises, bought a cottage and land at Poland Lane. So the wheel had turned full circle. She had returned to her childhood roots on the land. At Poland Lane she kept pigs, chickens and geese, and often said these were now the happiest days of her life. The hard times had just become a memory. She was never bitter about them. She saw them only as a challenge to be met and overcome. She died at 93 and with quiet satisfaction had seen her children achieve at least some degree of success. In fact, the only time she had serious mis misgivings was when I told her I was going to marry Lady Peter's granddaughter. This, of course, was Lady Peter of the Brougham, who I mentioned earlier. The age in which my mother had lived had been a religiously class-conscious one, and so her qualms were quite understandable. But the years that followed set her mind at rest. But there, I've almost forgotten to tell you the story of Lord Dorchester's pig. This was the pig, the equal, I suppose, of the Blanding's pig. And when it was stolen, consternation reigned. The unfortunate man who had care of it could throw no light on the mystery and could only tell the police in his own words. I took him a bucket of swill first thing in the morning, sir. I looked in the sty, and there he was, gone. Charlie Stonehouse, ever the opportunist, seized on the event to get his revenge on Sergeant Waters. Whenever the mystery of the pig came up in conversation, Charlie would mutter darkly, Ha ha, he knows who had him. News of this reached Sergeant Waters who found Charlie sitting outside the bell, looking rather sadly into his almost empty pint pot. Sergeant Waters replenished the glass and questioned Charlie at some length. But even after several free pints, he could get no more information from, from Charlie than the repeated statement, I doze who had him. Finally, the superintendent of police came from Aldershot, intent at getting the truth. The sergeant and the superintendent found Charlie, where else, at the bell. Charlie had one more pint and realised there was no more mileage to be had from the mystery. There then, said the superintendent, I understand that you know who had the pig. Yes, said Charlie, I knows who had him. Right, said the superintendent, who had him? Well, said Charlie, Lord Dorchester had him. Then he paused and added, but he ain't got him now.